Hello friends, I'm Max and you're watching my video about making an extra large forged chisel, which is also called a timber framing slick. I'm quite happy with this chisel's functionality and my only regret is that I haven't made it sooner. Such two-handed chisel is ideal to work on hard to reach spots where you can't get with your axe, spoke shave or hand plane. It is particularly good in applications where you need to combine precision with productivity. The huge flat blade's back allows you to use it as a smoothing plane. The long handle allows you to firmly hold it with both hands and use your upper body weight when needed. Because the blade is extra long, you can easily adjust an angle of attack of its cutting edge, thus micro-adjusting the depth of your cut. Note, I'm making wide thick shavings with ease without getting stuck even once. The chisel's weight adds control and allows to chop off pieces of wood using its weight and inertia. My chisel is 1 meter, 3 feet long and 5 cm 2 inch wide, forged from a leaf spring. It's not easy to buy a quality framing slick around here. This is why, after a few attempts to find a large enough framing chisel under $200, I decided to make it myself. They say, if you want to ensure that the job is done right, do it yourself. It wasn't in vain that I was in a hurry to finish making the chisel before leaving for my log cabin camp. My shaving horse, wooden mortar, wooden trough, earth oven's door and other small projects most likely wouldn't have been able to be completed without the new chisel during that trip. Because I finished the chisel's blacksmithing job the night before my departure, I had to make a temporary handle for it at the log cabin camp. Upon my return home, I decided to make something original and different. I'm still not sure if this is the handle I want to keep. Do you think this stabilized plywood handle looks good with polished metal? Should I go back to solid wood? What do you think of the shape? Let me know about your thoughts on this. But let's get back to business. First of all, I laid out the leaf spring and cut off a workpiece 52 mm 2 inches wide and slightly longer than needed. I only had hand tools at the time, which is why I used an angle grinder for most operations. I added an XLR connector and a soft start circuit to its power cord. It allows to safely insert the side grinder's disc into a started cut. It is quite convenient to have a soft start for any of your sharp tools. Please follow electrical safety guidelines in your country should you decide to do such an upgrade to your sharp tools. Okay, we got a 52mm to inch wide workpiece that is slightly curved, which is okay because it will be forged anyway. To prevent cutting yourself, it is best to remove sharp edges. You might have seen this metal headrest that I disassembled into parts and used some of them to make a primitive tent heater. It was a log torch with a curved pipe going through it. Because the pipe's intake stayed below the log torch's bottom edge, it only drew fresh air inside the tent. As the air passed through a heated portion of the pipe, it got hot. No smoke or carbon monoxide gets in since all of the hot gases jet out while surrounded by freezing air. I will leave a link to this video below. It gained over 11 million views in less than a year. Anyhow, I will use a metal leg from the same bed to forge the handle socket for my new chisel. I heated up the thick walled leg in my mini forge and shaped a cone from it. The quality of the cone's inner surface is not important. While working on the cone, I heated up the workpiece that will become the blade. Because my DIY forge is not large enough for long pieces, I had to rotate it and probably overheated the blade part. So I ended up with a good amount of scale left on the steel. I removed it using a hammer and an angle grinder. 
I will need to come up with a better descaling method next time though. While the metal plate is cooling down in the forge, I worked on the cone. I added some metal to the cone's end, removed oxide scale using a flap disc and cut the cone off longer than needed. Then I clamped the workpiece into the chuck to center it. Because the workpiece is three times longer than its diameter, I applied support to it with a tailstock. Now using both axle controls on the lathe, I roughly shaped the cone. You can probably tell that I've never controlled two axes at once before. Next, I protected the lathe from the flap disc's abrasive particles with a rag and used my trusty angle grinder to smoothen the socket's outer surface. Then I cut the cone off, smoothened the edge and turned a chamfer. Now it is time to smoothen all of the chisel's blade's surfaces. Because I didn't have a milling machine in my shop at the time, I reserved to using my angle grinder with a flap disc again. This is probably the most difficult and important step in the whole chisel making process, but if you give it your best, it will work out just fine. It is imperative not to take off too much material on one side, since it would distort the plate's geometry. This is why I start sanding in the center and work my way to the side of the workpiece. There is always a special moment during a project when you enjoy looking at an intermediate stage of the creation that will soon be changed. This is exactly such moment. It is a pity the high temperature oxidation scaling will destroy this smoothness. Now, as all of the needed parts are fabricated, we can assemble them into a chisel. But firstly, I need to shape the blade's shoulders and neck to give them aesthetically pleasing forms. As for these small geometric metal scraps, you will see them used in one of my upcoming projects. Before the blade is hardened, I roughly shaped the blade's bevel. It is easy to do it now, as the metal is still comparatively soft. Right before hardening, I also stamped the blade with two of my logos, but then I realized that the blade's geometry is not ideal and it might need to be redone. Oh well, you live and learn. It would be easier to start making a new blade from scratch, but I literally had hours left before the set departure time for my log cabin camp. So I decided to correct the blade's geometry by reheating it and taking advantage of the perfectly flat surface of my DIY anvil. Both logos were affected by scaling during the reheating process, but I eventually was able to achieve the blade's correct geometry with my angle grinder. All surfaces are perfectly flat and parallel now. You can see the blade's measurements on the caliper's display in metric. Now it is time to weld the blade's tank to the cone. To do that, I sharpened the blade's tank so it could align with the cone's tip's opening. It is important to align the handle's socket with the chisel's blade on a flat surface. The blade's back should be clamped flat along its whole length while the socket should be slightly elevated above the surface. I placed a metal ruler under it in my case. Once both parts are immobilized in such alignment, they can be welded together. I used aluminum foil and masking tape to protect polished surfaces from any overspray. As you can see, I am not an expert welder and the joint turned out to be less than pretty, but it is strong and reliable. They say, a grinder and paint makes me the welder I ain't. There were only three hours left before departure when I finished sharpening the chisel and made a polymer sheath for it. Once I got to my log cabin camp, I made a temporary chisel handle the next day. By the way, I didn't have to resharpen the chisel during my expedition even once. The cutting edge held up well, being protected by the polymer sheath when not in use. When I got back home, I decided to make a more ergonomic and original handle. Because my chisel is made from recycled metal, I figured the handle should follow the trend. 
There was a bunch of short leftover plywood pieces in my shop that were not long enough to make a handle, but if glued diagonally, they would do. It only takes a few minutes to cut them into the right work pieces. However, gluing them together in one step is a bit trickier. I marked all of the pieces to ensure the quick assembly into a glue-up block once adhesive is applied. I used the waterproof wood glue that has a fairly long open time, but there is still no time to waste during its final assembly for best results. I used the brush to quickly spread the glue on both sides of each workpiece. Once done, it is important to securely clamp the whole assembly. The more clamps you use, the better. Once the glue was set, I started to roughly shape the workpiece to be able to safely turn a handle on the lathe. A good hand plane is the best tool for such task. Special thanks to Alex Siegfried from Germany for this great hand plane. Now it is time to decide on the handle's length. Because my lathe can accept only 50cm 20 inches workpieces at largest, I will make the handle to be just that long for now. I might make it even longer in the future, because I plan to get a lathe bed extension. As I mounted the workpiece in the lathe and started its rough shaping, I realized that I could only scrape the plywood handle instead of cutting it. The result proved to be disappointing. However, I managed to avoid tear-outs using an angle grinder carving disc. It is a present from an expert wood carver, Michael Hartwood personalized with his engraving. The holes in the disc allow you to better see the material removal process while it's spinning fast. Once the handle is shaped and rough sanded, it is time to stabilize it with a special polymer. I used a Unifix PK80 clear polymer to impregnate the handle wrapped in aluminum foil. Unifix polymerizes when heated to about 80 degrees, so I just wrapped it back into foil and put it in a cooling down fireplace. This is a very simple process. Unlike other similar wood stabilizing polymers, such as an Anacrol 90, Unifix becomes very hard once cured, which makes it easy to turn the stabilized plywood handle on a lathe. You don't get as many tear outs. It feels as hard as an epoxy resin, only the epoxy resin wouldn't be able to penetrate the wood so deeply, being so thick. My homemade cyclone, made from a bucket and two plastic fittings a few years ago, is still going strong and provided an adequate dust collection for the mini lathe. Once stabilized, sanded and polished, the plywood handle got stronger and looks acceptably well. Because the handle is now polished, I might as well polish the chisel's blade for a good match. While using the polishing disc, I also made micro roundovers on the chisel where it was necessary to prevent cuts. I will be honest, I was quite satisfied with the result considering I failed to find an affordable framing chisel of comparable quality. As one sitcom character from Pony City once said, people who buy things are suckers. The project was interesting and the tool proved to be very helpful for many projects at my log cabin camp. This is Maxi Gorov from St. Petersburg, Russia. If you liked this video, perhaps you could share it with your friends. Let good people watch good videos. P.S. I only produce one or two videos max a month, and if you don't want to miss new content like this, subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with all of the latest content. Due to new YouTube's recommendation algorithm, its notifications have become more unstable otherwise. P.P.S. Below I left a link to my DIY projects playlist, as well as playlists about my log cabin building, bushcraft projects, kayaks making and outdoor cooking. I hope to see you back on Advoco Makes.